so yeah, as I as described, I'm Tudor Roman, one of the pediatric emergency uh, consultants in the Royal. I've been asked to talk about traumatic brain injury. Um, and this is quite a big, important topic uh, from a pediatric trauma point of view. And uh, my colleague, Stephen Mullen, who has attempted to kill me through uh, hundreds of burpees, um, if you missed the, the talk from this morning, has already talked about pediatric trauma. And it's quite hard, and he's done a well, good job uh, about talking about pediatric trauma without talking about traumatic brain injury. And the reason for that is that traumatic brain injury uh, accounts for the majority of um, traumatic-related deaths in children. And that's worldwide, not just in the UK. If you have a look, there's about 80% of pediatric trauma will include the head as part of the injury, and 40, upwards of 44, depending on which data you look at, uh, percent of pediatric trauma is an isolated head injury. So there's a significant uh, issue uh, with head injury in children. This is the TARN data. So you're going to see a bit of duplication from me and Stephen in that we're using similar data to talk about pediatric trauma because there's not an awful lot out there about UK statistics. And you can see the majority of um, injury are caused by head injury in children with a small proportion of polytrauma. And this becomes important, as Stephen alluded to, in our decisions as to how we image these children. So in adults, you get PAN scans, uh, and in children, um, uh, we are more selective about our imaging. So in pediatric uh, trauma, you choose which in images you're going to use rather than uh, just scanning everything. Traumatic brain injury results in a significant burden of morbidity and mortality. And if we're going to use some of the statistics from the states, uh, they see about 40, 475,000 traumatic brain injuries a year, 435,000 of those attend an emergency department, 3,700 are admitted, and 5,000 children are left with a permanent disability, uh, and 2,600 deaths. So it's a significant impact. And if we have a look at the number of patients who attend the ED and then the, the, the number that are admitted, you're getting upwards of 80 to 90 percent of pediatric traumatic brain injury that are discharged home without admission. These are deemed to have a minor head injury, and that's a Glasgow Coma Scale of uh, on arrival of 13 to 15. This group still has a mortality of 0.1% and a morbidity associated with this. And it's estimated that 30% of both adults and children have post-concussive symptoms lasting over 30 days after their initial head injury. And this has an impact on schooling, education, quality of life and can't be ignored. I just wanted to raise that point to, to emphasize that just because it's a minor brain injury is not something that we can, we can just discharge and forget about. We need to be giving concussion advice. We need to have schools engaging in concussion um, awareness uh, for sports uh, and, and going back to education as well. And follow-up uh, should be arranged, which not everyone like our hospital has for these, these patients. Our population, generally, we, uh, we see head injuries in uh, the zero to four-year-olds and then another spike in the 14 to 15-year-olds. There is a male predominance, depending on which research you look at. Some will say 1.5 to 1 and the others 3 to 1. Uh, and you get a predominance in the poorer socioeconomic areas. So in the nature of this uh, conference, we're going to engage you in some Slido, and hopefully my slides will work. Um, so what do you think? is the leading cause of pediatric traumatic brain injury in the UK? If you can answer those, that would be great. Okay, so we've got pedestrian versus car coming out equal with falls less than two meters, um, then inflicted injuries, and then falls from uh, more than two meters. So yes, the majority of trauma, traumatic brain injuries in children are caused by road traffic accidents, and that can be uh, pedestrian versus car, cyclists, or uh, passenger but pedestrian versus car being the highest proportion, then followed by falls of less than two meters. If we have a look at this group here, this is an interesting group. The under two years old, Stephen has already mentioned, has a disproportionate number who come in with non-accidental injury. And this is an important aspect of trauma in this age group, okay? And Stephen's already mentioned that. I'm sorry for the duplication, but uh, I didn't know how much uh, we would overlap on this talk. Okay, so under one year, uh, there is a significant proportion in this graph, 50% are coming in with possible non-accidental injury as the cause. And you could say, well, is that head injury? Well, this, this graph is head injury, uh, but 90% of all non-accidental injuries will involve the head as well. 
Um, I'm going to move past this one. This is just to emphasize that point Stephen made about a lot of children arriving uh, in hospital, not in an ambulance, not in a helicopter uh, or with a pre-alert. And these kids can still have significant trauma uh, that needs, uh, uh, in, uh, needs to be managed. Okay, so don't expect your children to become to come in packaged and with the, the label of trauma. So when we look at traumatic brain injury, um, there is an initial primary insult, and this can be caused by a blunt injury, penetrating injury, or a blast injury. Whatever it causes, you're going to get damage to the brain, and initial um, cells in the brain are going to die. And there's nothing we can do about that. Okay, but understanding some of the some of the um, injuries that you can get will also help us know what interventions we may be able to put into place uh, to try and minimize secondary damage, which is going to be the mainstay of our management. So what is the most common finding on an initial CT for a severe traumatic brain injury? And just remember, I'm asking about severe traumatic brain injury. You've got a rough classification using Glasgow Cone scale of minor traumatic brain injury being a GCS of 13 to 15, moderate being a Glasgow Coma scale uh, of 9 to, to uh, 12, and then less than 9 being a severe uh, traumatic brain injury. Okay. So subarachnoid hemorrhage is actually the, the top cause, the uh, top identified and initial um, CT finding in 30 to 40% of all moderate to severe um, uh, traumatic brain injuries. And this is a, a poor prognostic indicator. A lot of you mentioned diffuse axonal injury or um, this, this is a, that's a bit of a trick question because it's the initial presentation. And, and we'll talk about that in a second, but I'm just going to run through some of the others just because I, I, I don't want to mess up my slides here. But we'll talk about diffuse axonal injury at the end here. So you can also get other in, uh, injuries, intercerebral hemorrhage, coup and counter coup injuries. These are your acceleration, deceleration injuries in which you get a, a bruising to the brain on the inside of the injury. And then sometimes if the brain moves across and causes damage on the opposite side, and you get those in 20 to 30% of moderate to severe injuries. Skull fractures, subdural and epidural hematomas, and these can uh, cause mass effect and uh, increased risk of intracranial pressure rise and coning. And then I've got no picture here for axonal injury. And the reason for that is that um, they suspect that most um, traumatic brain injuries have some degree of focal axonal injury, but you're never going to see that on, on CT. Okay. And 70% of moderate to severe um, uh, head injury have a diffuse um, uh, axonal injury. And diffuse axonal injury uh, is a poor, very poor prognostic indicator, but you're only going to see it on CT about, uh, sorry, the CT is going to be normal for about 50 to 80% of these patients. So it's not the most seen on a, a CT, on initial CT. So understanding a little bit about what happens after the primary injury can help us understand where the importance of our management comes in. And that's what we're trying to focus on is what can we do to try and minimize the damage of this that this child is going to undergo. And although I've mentioned minor traumatic brain injury, um, I'm going to focus mainly on those with a decreased level of consciousness, so moderate to severe brain injury. I'm sorry, I didn't put in a case to, to discuss around. Um, so following the primary event, secondary damage results from exp an expanding hematoma or the physiological response to the first injury. And this can be um, loss of order regulation, which seems to happen more in the, the children uh, than in adults, in which they, they lose the ability to, to um, moderate or to control their cerebral blood flow. You get compromised cerebral perfusion as a result. You get an increasing metabolic demand due to the inflammatory response, but also due, due to the cell death that, that occurs. Uh, and you get further uh, cell death as a result of that. Um, and then you get cerebral edema developing, and this can develop uh, 24 to 72 hours after the injury and results in increasing pressure with potential herniation and death. So there's a number of different things that are going on inside that brain following an injury. Not all head injuries will progress to this degree depending on what's caused them, but these are the potentials. We know that the highest risk groups that we have are those that are under four years of age, 
those that have developed hypoxia, hypotension, have a low develop um, have a low GCS on initial presentation, and have coagulopathy or hyperglycemia. And if we know that, this highlights the importance of the structured approach that we want to take to any child with a traumatic brain injury, regardless of whether you're in a pre-hospital setting, a DGH, uh, or tertiary center. Your initial management is going to follow that standard A B C D E approach, or the trauma one trauma one C A B C D E approach. You're going to then want to normalize all physiology as much as you can, putting into place neuroprotective measures, getting urgent CT in discussion with neurosurgery, uh, and then conducting frequent uh, monitoring uh, to 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 identify decline if there is any. So that is your standard approach starting with your CABCDE approach and then constant reassessment uh, and imaging. I wanna chuck out uh, a word about C-spine precautions. Okay, any child who comes in with a significant head injury and decreased level of consciousness should have um, C-spine uh, precautions put in place. You cannot tell whether this child has got a C-spine injury. Um, you've got an intubated child potentially confused they might be distracting injuries. They might be combative. There's a number of reasons why this might be hard to assess. So one study has shown that 30% of children with severe traumatic brain injury had findings on imaging of C-spine abnormality. There's also this thing called um, significant cervical spine injury without radiological abnormality, SWARA. Okay, so just because you get a CT scan or an image that shows no fracture, uh, of the C-spine does not mean that there isn't an injury. So suspect this, protect the C-spine, um, and, uh, uh, and this can be further investigated as the progression of the child's condition uh, goes on and further assessment is done. Collars are a controversial topic. We've stopped using them to a huge amount because they're often put on wrong, uh, incorrectly sized, or the child becomes quite distressed in them. Okay, not like this wee man here. Okay, so because of those reasons, we often don't put them on and we, we choose to use sandbags and tape uh, to immobilize the child. If the child comes into my emergency department with the collar on and it's fitted well, uh, I will not take that off. Um, or if I uh, am sending this child to another department, either to CT, ICU, you may consider putting on a collar to indicate that this child's C-spine is not cleared. Okay, so the primary cause is not necessarily to, to immobilize the C-spine. It's more of an indicator to everybody else that this still needs to be considered. But remember, if you're doing that, don't put it on too tight because theoretically they can obscure the, um, uh, obstruct the SVC um, flow from the head and raise into cranial pressure. So loosening the collar would be one of your neuroprotective measures. Welcome to my daughter here many, many years ago. Um, uh, so she has given permission for this airway and breathing. All right. So this is one of the big steps. I've already told you that hypoxia, uh, arrival with hypoxia is a poor prognostic indicator. So you want to take control of that airway and breathing, um, as soon as possible. Um, you want to ensure that the child's breathing at a normal rate has a normal oxygenation. If they're tolerating a mask, then give them some oxygen. If they're needing um, extra support, either because they're hypoventilating and or you're not able to bring up their oxygen uh, with um, the SpO2 with oxygen, uh, or they're hyperventilating, then you may need to take over their breathing. So indications for intubation would include a GCS of less than nine because you lose your protective airway reflexes at that stage. And if you're going on the old school AVPU, that's a, that's a score of P, uh, responding only to pain. If they have obstructive or irregular breathing, you may need to consider this. If they're hypoxic, uh, with not corrected with oxygen, or if they're hyperventilating. And this is important because if they hyperventilate, they reduce their CO2. And if they reduce their CO2 concentration in their blood, um, this reduces the oxygen delivery uh, that the brain is getting. Other issue, um, reasons that I put in here is if you, if you aren't able to get adequate pain relief for this child, you may need to... In, um, instigate, uh, need to intubate them for that reason. If they're severely agitated or if they have seizures, 
or if you are expecting them to potentially deteriorate in an unsafe environment, such as in transport, then you need to think of that as well. And you need to expect the deterioration uh, and consider it. Never leave the intubation until it's critical. Uh, if you can, and there's a time phase for you to do this in a controlled manner, then that's the time to do it. If you wait until they're deteriorating, they're becoming hypoxic or they're dropping their blood pressure, then this is going to lead to further uh, damage, secondary damage to the already damaged brain. In the pre-hospital setting, what I would say is that if you are not someone who is regularly intubating children, but you're able to maintain airway with just oxygen or bag and mask ventilation, then this is what you should do. There is some evidence to show that uh, pre-hospital intubation uh, of children uh, not done by air ambulance um, has a detrimental effect. Um, and it's similar to, to the question I often get asked about a child coming in in cardiac arrest. Um, should we have intubated in the pre-hospital setting? And my answer is if you're getting chest rise and you're able to oxygenate um, uh, using bag and mask ventilation, and that is what you, uh, and, and you're getting a good result from that, continue to do that unless you are the expert that is able to get that tube in uh, well. Now, intubation should be used, uh, you should be using drugs to do this. Do not intubate a child with a head injury without any drugs. And that is a, a, good, a good idea for most things. Um, and the reason for this is that regardless of whether you think their GCS is reduced, intubation is painful and pain increases your ICP, uh, which then further compromises their head injury. So we're gonna consider which drugs we wanna use for intubation. What would you suggest? I can see there's some people who have been on a pediatric emergency course already, and we mustn't have very many Americans here. And Peter Cosgrove obviously hasn't uh, responded yet. Okay, so everyone, most people are saying ketamine, and uh, a few people are saying whatever the hell they choose. And I think there's a, um, there's a, a merit for both of those. So etomidate I put in there because that's the um, up-to-date uh, recommendation because it has good neuroprotective measures and cardiovascular stable. Um, but it's not something we use very much in the UK. Ketamine was initially not liked due to the potential risk of raising ICP um, uh, on initial administration. And there's been a system, systematic review looking uh, at, which included two studies with children, that, which didn't really back that up. And now this is the choice um, drug that we use. It does sometimes have a little um, uplift of blood pressure when giving it, and that might even be a bit more protective because you're preventing that potential hypotension that you can get with some other agents like propofol. So APLS guidelines now actually recommend ketamine as well in their, their new addition. I think whichever drug you choose, you need to be familiar with it. So uh, a lot of people who are gonna be doing these intubations are anesthetic or um, ICU doctors. And these are people, you guys know what your drugs you use. And as long as you can predict what you're going to get when you give the drugs and you can counter that and ensure that this child doesn't become hypotensive while giving it, um, then I think as long as you can do that, it's fine to, to, to go on. Um, you need to make sure that you are cardiovascularly stable uh, or at least supported and uh, predict if there's going to be a, blood, uh, a drop in the blood pressure. Remember when you're intubating, you need to consider um, doing, you need to do, not consider, you need to do a quick neurological assessment. That includes a, a Glasgow coma scale, looking at the pupils, looking for localizing signs and seizure activity, because once you've intubated and paralyzed this child, you're not going to get that opportunity again. So be, be mindful of that when, you, when you're thinking of intubation. And you want to know, was this child like this prior to my intubation or only after? So the benefits of intubation are numerous. Um, you're securing an airway for a child who's obtunded, who may vomit um, and is going to have C-spine precautions in place. Um, you're going to be able to control oxygenation and the rate of breathing, maximizing neuroprotection. Um, you're going to be able to give better pain relief. You're going to reduce the metabolic demand and oxygen requirement of that damaged brain tissue. And it also allows for safer transfer and investigation of this child. So there's lots of reasons why we might want to do that. So don't panic. Um, this is a, a common thing that we find both, both in a cardiovascular, sorry, a cardiac arrest 
uh, and in other other times in which we have to ventilate children, people get quite excited uh, and they start bagging quite excessively. And this is a one of those times in which you do not want to do that. As I've already said, blowing off the CO2 with hyperventilation can cause vas uh, can cause um, uh, poor oxygen delivery uh, to the brain and further damage. So you're wanting to keep their saturations normal. If you have um, capnography available, which you should have if you've intubated, you're aiming to keep PCO2 between 4.5 and 6. Once you have arterial access, you can base your, your decisions on um, uh, your, your gases rather than capnography, which would be more accurate. Uh, but you don't want to hyperventilate. So don't go excessive on the bagging and make sure it's a steady rate and it's maintaining oxygen levels at 94 to 98 with normal PCO2. Hyperventilation is something that has been looked at uh, for children who deteriorate uh, with raised intracranial pressure and signs of uh, potential herniation. Uh, and this allows for um, reduction of perfusion. So hyperventilation leads to um, vasoconstriction, which reduces the blood flow around the brain and sometimes can be used in an emergency situation to reduce uh, the, the volume inside the, the skull. Um, recommendations uh, in the consensus study uh, for traumatic brain injury in children says that this shouldn't be used for the first 24 to 48 hours after the head injury. So I don't have any experience in using it myself, and maybe some of the, the panel uh, will have uh, done so. Uh, but it is one of the, the tool, tools that you may have to rapidly reduce um, uh, intercerebral pressure. And maybe with the, the swelling occurring, the cerebral edema occurring 24 to 72 hours, it's maybe something that's done more in intensive care uh, rather than in the EDs or pre-hospital. Cardiovascular. I've got this little equation up here, CPP equals MAP minus ICP. All of a sudden, I've uh, had a little fear that I got it up wrong, but I think that's right. CPP, so central perfusion pressure equals, equals mean arterial pressure minus ICP. And this just indicates how significant blood pressure is in the maintenance of central perfusion pressure. And the aim for, for any management of a traumatic brain injury is to normalize uh, as much as possible to maximize perfusion to the brain uh, and um, oxygenation to the tissue. So hypovolemia should be aggressively managed. As mentioned before, children often lose uh, their ability to auto-regulate their cerebral blood flow following head injury. In order to maintain an adequate cere cerebral perfusion pressure, um, blood pressure must be normal. Drops in BP significantly increase, uh, affect the perfusion of the brain. Some adult studies have even shown that um, for one episode of hypotension uh, following a traumatic brain injury, you double the risk of death. So it's a significant issue. Prior to theaters and ICU, so theaters is where the neurosurgeon may put in an intracerebral pressure monitor. Um, uh, prior to that being available and arterial lines being available, we're gonna to have to control blood pressure. This can be achieved through fluid boluses, uh, blood volume. And the reason I put blood in there is because often these are due to bleeds. If you have a look at the younger kids coming in with non-accidental injury, being shaken, they may have significant extracranial, so bleeds under the skull, sculpt that um, uh, lose large volumes of blood. And blood products are the correct ma uh, management in this, in this occasion. If you use multiple fluid boluses and you cause anemia, that again reduces oxygen delivery to the brain. So you're wanting to maximize this uh, blood pressure. Once you have done fluids and you're still feeling like the blood pressure is labile, you may want to consider some inotropes. My only mention of this is that if you are putting up something like adrenaline, just be very cautious that you don't get a sudden rise in blood pressure and, um, and peak in heart rate, which may increase your ICP uh, temporarily. Okay, so be cautious as you start these things, uh, trying to aim for normal blood pressure at all times. The other question uh, with uh, isolated head injuries is in the cardiovascular side is, should we use TXA? What's your thoughts? Isolated head injury. I like the honesty of some people. <laughs> so there's a mix there. So adults would, but studies are not conclusive in children. And that's correct. So CRASH-3 has been done 
and it showed that TXA was beneficial in mild to moderate brain injury if given within three hours. Okay. There haven't been, um, there's been a few, uh, there's been a few pediatric studies uh, done looking at some of this, but none of them have been overly conclusive. Uh, one study um, suggested that there was a mild increase in seizure um, in 0.3% of the patients, um, but that was not um, that was not reflected in a, a systematic review of all the literature available. There are other studies in the process looking at both the use of TXA in isolated head injury, but also the dosing of TXA um, in minor head injury. So it is currently an accepted practice that we have utilized the CRAS-3 data uh, and extrapolated that to our pediatric patients. And so now we do give TXA in isolated head injuries, as long as there's a decreased level of consciousness or an identified bleed on CT um, uh, within three hours of the accident. Okay, so those are our criteria, and that's reflected it both in the APLS manual um, uh, in seventh edition and the NICE guidelines. Uh, and the dose is 50 milligrams per kilogram, um, followed by a two milligram per kilogram per hour um, bolus, uh, sorry, maintenance, um, as long as it can be started within three hours. Glasgow coma scale. So we're on to D. So we've spent a bit of time on A and B and C. And the importance of that is because we're trying to maximize um, the oxygenation and perfusion of this damaged brain. So we're on to D now. Uh, when we're looking at this, we, we, we want to use the Glasgow Coma Scale instead of a crude source of AVPU score that we use in ED. Uh, and the reason for this is you're looking for minor changes in this uh, Glasgow Coma Scale. So you may have a child who comes in with a GCS of 15 following a head injury. And for some reason, you're, you're observing them on for a period of time because NICE guidelines say if they have one concerning feature, they have to stay for a period of observation. And during that time, if you're not looking at the GCSC, GCS, not GCSEs, uh, GCS, then you're going to miss the deterioration of this child who then becomes, goes from being a minor head injury to being a moderate or severe head injury as they have an expanding extradural hematoma. Okay, um, so you need to observe them closely. You're looking at their GCS, constantly monitoring them for change in their GCS, monitoring their blood pressure, their heart rate, and their respiratory rate. And this allows you to predict when there's going to be a change and interact, uh, interact as soon as possible. What our aim for D and for this management is we're trying to get this child to CT scan as quickly as possible. And the reason for that is because then we can involve the neurosurgeons, they can drain hematomas, they can put in ICP monitors. And any child who has a decreased level of consciousness as a result of a trauma to the head should have neurosurgery consulted. So NICE guidelines have a, um, a guideline for us to use uh, for when we should uh, instigate a CT scan for a child with a head injury. And there's a number of different criteria there. Um, and they say that we should be doing it within one hour if any of these features are present. So suspicion of non-accidental injury, post-traumatic seizures, decreased level of consciousness, suspected a skull fracture or depressed skull fracture, any signs of basal skull fracture or uh, for children under one with large bruises. So we should be getting CTs within an hour. Some of the other guidelines that I looked at when preparing this talk said that they should get a CT within 30 minutes. And I suppose I would agree with that. Your aim in an in initial resuscitation is to stabilize them as quickly as possible um, and move them to CT. There's that saying that time is brain, okay? So the longer you keep them there, fiddling with different things, uh, the longer uh, the chance that there is going to be more significant secondary brain injury. And you're wanting to get this child up to theater if there's something that needs to be done, even if it's not just for an ICP or an EVD um, uh, for further management of this, um, uh, of this significant brain injury. Um, so if they identify bleeds, they can drain them. If it's concern regarding axonal shear or significant injury, when they suspecting significant cerebral edema uh, later on, then an ICP monitor or an EVD might help uh, with management of that. Okay. I'm five, five minutes. Yeah. Other neuroprotective measures that you're going to use, I've already talked about 20 to 30 degree head up tilt. Analgesia, I've said, don't leave this child in pain. Normothermia, so hypothermia has been looked at 
Um, we don't generally do that in children. Hypothermia can cause significant um, uh, problems with if you have coagulation and it's the uh, part of the triad uh, of death in trauma. Normal glycemia, normal electrolytes aiming for your sodium to be at least 140 and seizure control. And seizure control is quite an interesting one in that um, there's no real evidence for prophylactic treatment unless you're trying to prevent sort of seizures within the first seven days of seizure uh, of, of the head injury. Um, but there's no convincing evidence that giving it early is helpful. Now I have done this. I have given Keppra to a child with a significant injury uh, because of uh, the high risk of seizures. And if the child seizes, that increases metabolic demand to the brain uh, and further damage. Signs of herniation. So clinical signs of impending herniation include pupil asymmetry, unilateral bilateral fixed and dilated pupils, decorticate or disseverate posturing, respiratory depression, and then the Cushing's triad, hypertension, bradycardia, and irregular respirations. And this needs urgent action. So we've already talked about it some of these, 30 degree head up tilt, hypertonic saline. Is a, uh, there's a, a, a few studies that have looked hypertonic saline over mannitol. I use hypertonic saline because I'm used to it. Uh, and I know that hypertonic saline also is a plasma expander, whereas mannitol is the diuretic. And in a child and wanting to maintain their, their blood pressure, hypertonic saline makes sense to me. But use what you're used to, because this is an emergency. So you just get it in. Hyperventilation is a questionable thing, depending on when it is in the head injury scale. And then you may need to intubate and sedate. Uh, and this child may need to go urgently to CT for further definitive care. OK, so I just want to quickly summarize here. The moderate to severe head injuries need ICU and neurosurgical input. From the pre-hospital team, you are protecting the C-spine, preventing hypoxia and preventing hypotension. In the DGH, your aims are to stabilize the ABC, maximizing the physiological parameters uh, to as close to normal as you can get them, initiating neuroprotective measures, getting urgent imaging and, con and constantly reassessing that GCS while communicating with the receiving team. And communication becomes extremely important. A decision to transfer to a, a center with neurosurgical ability needs to have clear communication. You need to know who you've spoken to, what the plan is when you transfer them, where you're going when you arrive in, in the ambulance with this child. Because these are often time critical transfers that cannot wait for the retrieval team. But what you'll do is a disservice to this child is if they just turn up to a tertiary ED where further assessment needs to be made, further communication needs to be done uh, with the specialties. These children should be packaged and ready to go by their arrival time so that there's no further delay in their management. And that re relies on communication. So thank you. Um, I know I ran over a bit and I'm hoping that wasn't uh, too much of a textbook for you, but um, any questions? Uh, there's a couple of questions there from the, the Slido. Um, it said, uh, would you actively reduce hypertension and traumatic brain injury in what cases and how? Um, can you still hear me? Yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't actively reduce my blood pressure uh, in, in uh, head injury patients. Uh, I would want to keep it normalized. Um, Stephen, what do you think? Uh, I, I would agree. I think physiologically you're talking about the hypertension from that expanded mass inside the brain. So it's your body's response to try and perfuse the brain. So if you drop the blood pressure, you're going to cause hyperperfusion and further injury. So I think in that acute phase, when you've got a head injury and the blood pressure is high, it's your body trying to keep some sort of brain tissue alive. So I personally don't uh, like to bring it down. But it'll be interesting to see what the rest of the guys feel. Yeah, it's actually, this is this is your body's survival mechanism. It's try, You're trying to raise the blood pressure to get blood to that tight brain. And if you look at the, the numbers we target in the ICU, they're actually higher than normal. Um, and noradrenaline tends to be the drug that we use to achieve that particular blood pressure but because we're just wanting to squeeze and we're just wanting to pressure rather than to do anything with the heart. Um, in my app, there is cerebral perfusion targets that you can use at each of the different ages. Um, but generally, if you, if you don't have those, you're, you're, you're targeting normally the 95th percentile for for blood pressure so it's it's the higher end of normal is generally what you want in these patients yeah the other the other bit i wanted to touch on because you brought it up a few times here about hyperventilation and 
wasn't something I had heard about delaying that over the first 48 hours I think you had mentioned. Um, it wouldn't be something that would put me off. And quite often you are hyperventilating these patients acutely if you think they're coning. Um, it's one of the quickest things that you can do to, to potentially stop that while you get them to a, a theater for a neurosurgeon to do something with their with their brain. You do want to do it with caution because the, the relationship to CO2, you're, you'll bling blood getting into the head down. If you overdo it, then you get cerebral ischemia. So it, it's something you would do with caution. But if you think the patient's coning in front of you, bringing it down acutely for that short period of time while you get them to an operation is, is something I would do. And I, I wouldn't have any qualms about doing that in the first 48 hours. Yeah, it wasn't something I had heard of just until I started going through the literature in a yeah. little bit more detail. They had talked about there's some controversy over whether you should be doing this within the first 24 to 72 hours. Yeah. Um, but that could be adult studies as well. I mean, you're, you're talking about a child who's going to die if you don't do something. Yeah. Uh, and I think you use all the utilities that you have. Yeah. There, there's quite often a difference. Quite often, there'll be different levels of hyperventilation you'll do in the ICU. If you're if you're really struggling and you're doing lots of therapies to reduce intracranial pressure, you can add a bit of mild hyperventilation, or hyperventilation and, and actually drop the CO2 down. You're to maybe four to four and a half. Um, but, it, but again, they're, they're like a stepwise process and a lot of units will have guidelines about the order you do things in. But we're, it, for that acute patient who's about to cone, it's a life-saving intervention, but it doesn't last forever. And you, it get, buys you a little bit of time while you get the patient to definitive care. I think that's the thing, Chris. I don't, I don't mm. necessarily find that it buys you much time. Um, sometimes I question how useful it is in terms of what it's actually trying to achieve at all. Um, I'm very liberal with hypertonic saline and start hypertonic saline infusions as well while I'm you know, doing all the rest of it to try and get this patient to where they need to be. Um, and obviously, if this is in the middle of the night and you're getting a neurosurgeon in from home, there's a lot of time delays as well. So yeah. um, that's, can, you know, potentially quite a long period of time when you're trying to hyperventilate somebody. So yeah. the efficacy of it, it's worth, a, it's worth a shot. You have to throw everything at these patients. But I would have a low threshold for starting a hypertonic saline infusion as well. Yeah, I think you want you want to go after everything in these situations, Peter. You're you're uh, you're, you're clutching the straws, and you'll take anything that you can possibly do. And it's it's important to remember what is actually causing the pressure. Is it a swollen brain where hypertonic and mannitol will will work great? Is there something externally compressed in the brain that you, a neurosurgeon could remove and relieve the pressure, or is it something to do with the blood that you're trying to manipulate? The blood getting in, the blood getting out of the head, and that's where these other things come in. For that, yeah, and, and you might not know is the other thing. Yeah, that's it. There's times when you've got a neurosurgeon in and you skip the CT scan and you go straight to put in an EBD and actually, you know, it doesn't make a blind bit of difference because the problem is, you know, global hypoxic ischemic changes or whatever, rather than an evolving hydrocephalus rather than a bleed. So you don't always know what the etiology is because it can vary and change. I, I often think of a good way to remember it is when you're, you've got that initial patient and you're thinking about intubating them, it's try to avoid all the itches. So it's the hypoxia, the hypercapnia, and the hypotension round about the intubation, and that they're the main ones. You've got the other hitches, the hyper, the hyperparexia, the hypo and hyperglycemia, but the the first three are the main ones around that peri intubation period. And you know you're you're going to have to try and avoid them. So if you've got a patient who's hypoventilated and their CO two is high and they're potentially hypoxic, taking care of the airways is the most important thing you can do and correct those at the start. Uh, there was one further question. I think we've sort of touched on already. Um, but it mentions what indications would you use for hyperosmolar therapy prior to CT in traumatic brain injury? And if so, what agent? So I generally use hypertonic saline because it's something that we are a little bit more used to from a pediatric background that we used to use for bronchiolitis. So it's just that link. So I would use hypertonic saline. I think there's some evidence to suggest it's slightly better. I like the fact that it doesn't cause your osmotic diuresis, which you might get the mannitol. So you're keeping the blood pressure going to the head. You look at the new PLS, APLS manual, it seems to be referring hypertonic as well over mannitol. I don't think there's any major differences between the two of them. I would usually initiate it if I thought there was concerns that this patient was having active herniation and getting anywhere near Conan. So I wouldn't wait for the pupil to blow. But if I had concerns that there was a significant head injury and that I was losing, I would be very, like Peter, kind of very liberal in its use. I don't think there's massive side effects associated with it. So that's uh, how I practice. And I'd probably also, if 
if you go to CT and then you see some signs that are concerning, give it as well. Um, so CT or if there's evidence or you're concerned, um, give it. I would use it quite early as well. I don't think they would need to be that severe. Um, you know, if they're if they're presenting with a reduced conscious level and you're you're bad enough that you're going to CT, I would be probably tempted to fire a little bit in, um, in advance. And it would be hypertonic that I would tend to use first line again. It, it doesn't the the with the diuresis that you get with the mannitol. If you're looking at your osmolalities and electrolytes later, looking at diabetes insipidus, um, it's just safer with a hypertonic saline. But if you've given one bolus of hypertonic and it's probably not working you might get more bang for your buck certainly swapping over and giving a wee bit of mannitol in uh, rather than just repeating the same therapy that's not working 